Great. Thank you, uh, Deb, for the introduction. Um, today to show you the workflow that we've designed at the Broad Institute, in which we've gone systematically through every step of the way to analyze FFPE blocks uh, in our lab. And really, before I get going, um, the proteomics group at the Broad Institute really looks into different uh, questions, mostly protein interactions and signaling pathways. But we also expand that to PTM landscapes. And we do integrate a lot of these multi-ohm data sets for different type of tissue. At the same time, we do have some HDX and protein dynamic analyses um, in our lab. And we're really excited to try to integrate some of that into our FFPE blocks. Now, um, the reason that FFPE blocks uh, are of high interest to us is because of uh, the biorepositories containing plenty of these blocks. We know there's hundreds of thousands of these blocks, and we do know that there's going to be a lot of follow-up information from patients and the medications they were on, a lot of metadata that would help us in uh, understanding more about the diseases in question. But the challenges with analyzing these blocks is that right before excision, the tissue, uh, right after excision, the tissue would get transferred into uh, formalin, and then formalin would have to penetrate through a tissue, and that would harden the tissue. But at the same time, that can introduce a lot of cross-linking artifacts, knowing that formalin would result in unstable intermediates like methylol, which turns into a shift phase, and that would cross-link any nucleophilic groups together. And the other thing is that these blocks are are pretty much cost effective to store at room temperature. However, we don't know much about the protein stability and how much in terms of fields are we gonna be working with. Now, um, a typical LCMS background um, in a shotgun experiment in proteomics typically involves a starting material which gets sliced and then the proteins will get extracted in a denaturing environment. It gets digested with a protease and then these peptides, we get injected on mass spectrometer for LCMS analysis. And then we just sequence these peptides and trace them back to the original unique proteins so that we can quantify abundances off of that. However, FFPE blocks are not easy to enter this proteomic process given that they're covered in wax. And any um, wax can potentially introduce a lot of downstream contaminations, but also decross-linking the tissue is another problem. And a lot of people in the past have used the xylene-based workflows, which Lynn went in detail over. And um, to briefly dis, uh, cover this again, um, you're getting your FFB scroll, and you're transferring it onto a slide, and then that slide would get de-waxed in xylene, and then it gets transferred into an ethanol water uh, multiple washes, and the idea is that you're rehydrating the tissue from the formalin um, step, and then the tissue gets dried down, transferred back into a new lysis buffer, and it gets decross-linked and homogenized somehow, whether it's mechanical or sonication, and then it gets digested uh, for LCMS analysis. And this is where Covaris would simplify a lot of our workflows. Um, rather than doing this uh, sample by sample, which is pretty lengthy, um, we're able to do this in the 96 well fashion. And at the Broad, we really try to analyze like hundreds of samples at a time, so doing full scroll analysis is not feasible at all. Um, that Covaris play, on the other hand, has been pretty helpful for us. And we've done some optimization on the sonication sides that'll go into, but the whole idea is that the scrolls are transferred into the plate containing tissue lysis buffer, and then the plate would get stored at minus 80 until the time of analysis. And the process of deparaffinization is usually um, ultrasonication, and for a whole plate, it would take about an hour, followed by the cross-linking with a thermal cycler at 90 C. We do that for almost 90 minutes. And then we follow that up with another round of ultrasonication for another hour to homogenize the tissue. And then because we're interested in a lot of doing the label-free analysis, what we've uh, evaluated was both the S-trap-based workflow, out of which you're just precipitating your protein on a glass filter. And for this process, we use the plate S-trap to evaluate. But also you can do the SP3, uh, uh, SP3 magnetic beads process where you're just capturing protein in an unbiased manner using surface bead chemistry. And we've evaluated both of, both of these and then to do a lot of these sample normalization steps like peptide uh, quant or uh, digestion buffer preparation or any of the 
uh, input for desalting, we'd use open trust to automate a lot of these uh, single channel pipetting, which would enhance reproducibility, but also speed up the uh, process significantly. And for our analyses, we've been doing a lot of DIA analysis. Um, for, the, for this development right now, we are using the Explorers 480, which is a very common instrument available in many labs. And we did the searches using FragPipe that we've uploaded on Terra. And for anyone who's not familiar, Terra is a platform that we use in the Broad Institute, which allows you to run a lot of the software for data search, uh, database searching natively on the cloud, which expands the scalability of our analyses. And I'm gonna start getting into the results of uh, the initial optimization steps. So two conditions that we evaluated um, we look into the duty factor, which represents the active sonication time of our tissue, but we've also looked into the amount of buffer that we're using, whether it's sufficient to extract as much protein out of our scrolls or not. And I want to remind everyone that we're using breast cancer and colorectal cancer blocks. Back then, they were like 20 years old, and we know that uh, we did each of these experiments in uh, four different replicates. And the three conditions that were evaluated was a standard 25% duty factor with the 100 microliter of tissue lysis buffer, which is shown in blue, or we, you just increase the duty factor by 50%, which is shown in orange, and then in green, we're showing the 50% duty factor coupled with the extra lysis buffer that we're using. And as we're seeing, we're almost uh, looking at almost 2x increase in protein yields that were extracted by combining both conditions. Now, the other thing that we're looking into is to maximize um, input, uh, peptide output, by being a little bit stringent on the input side. So these replicates uh, were divided into uh, the S-strap and the SP3 process. And the way we did this, we went really low to 50 microgram input. And we evaluated two different S-strap uh, workflows. The S-strap that relies on just the covaris lysis buffer, where you just acidify and precipitate and load on the S-strap plate or you'd spike in the additional uh, SDS to meet the SDS uh, requirement that Protify recommends. And we've also evaluated the SP3 on the side where you just do reduction alkylation and then you immediately um, integrate the SP3 on there. And overall, and overall when we uh, look at the protein identifications, regardless of the method, we're seeing almost 7,000 proteins from each injection across both breast cancer and colorectal cancer block. It's worth noting that we're seeing you know, a major difference in terms of breast cancer and colorectal cancer block when it comes to peptide quant. And the reason being is just has to do with tissue nature. Now, more stats to look into is the peptide identification summary. Um, we're looking at almost 40,000 peptides from each sample with a DIA method that we're using on the explorers. But also another measure of reproducibility is a total tick. So um, that gives us confidence in the reproducibility of our workflow, given that we're relying on open trons and stage step desalting for our workflows. And when we look at miscleavage rate of our samples, I mean, everything is under 20%, which is pretty good uh, for our typical tissue samples. So the first conclusion that we've uh, evaluated here is that 150% duty factor coupled with 150 microliters of tissue lysis buffer is sufficient to maximize yield. And coupled with DIA, we'd be able to, to achieve extensive depth from full scroll analysis. Now we wanted to push this a little bit further. We wanted to see how does this workflow apply to macrodissected tissue. And the idea is we've worked with the same type of blocks, colorectal and breast cancers. And uh, these blocks were scrolled, were stained, and then tissue uh, tumor-rich areas were um, enriched. And we had one question here because um, tissue macrodissection is usually a lengthy process. So uh, we decided to split our four replicates into two conditions, whether you transfer your tissue into a plate containing tissue lysis buffer, or you just store your tissue dry in the Kovar split. And the reason this is being evaluated, just more practical to transfer uh, macrodissected material uh, into a liquid, just uh, given to the static issues that you'd run into. And then we just passed this through our typical um, workflow with the S-trap and the open trons, and we analyzed that with DIA. And uh, when we're looking at protein yields, given the protein storage stability, um, we're, whether we have TLB in our tissue light, uh, in our Kovaris plate, or no buffer in aquavars plates, we're seeing no differences in the amount of protein that's being extracted. And this way, we just decided to stick with having uh, to Kovaris plates that are pre-filled with tissue lysis buffer, as long as this uh, plate is stored at minus 80. Now, when we look at proteome depth, 
we're seeing almost 8,000 proteins from each injection. And the peptide depth from each sample is almost 50,000 IDs, which is consistent with our previous observations. And here I'm plotting the protein CVs in a violent plot just to measure the reproducibility among four different samples. And we can see the protein abundance median CV before normalization is under uh, 0.2 for all of our tissue. Now, another question that we wanted to stress test this workflow with is the efficiency of the cross-linking. So what we've done is we've decided to pool a sample that would uh, represent all of uh, the blocks that we've worked with. And we fractionated the sample into five different samples, ran it using DDA, and then we did a PTM discovery search, uh, the open search on FractPipe, to just look for all potential peptidoforms, forms, what we are missing on, what we are uh, recovering. And based on the results, I mean, we're recovering 80% of all peptidoforms, forms, which is pretty good for samples that are really 20 years old. And um, from these peptidoforms, we're seeing 20,000 that are observed in both forms. However, the uniquely modified ones only make up 9,000 overall. And that includes FFPE mods and all other mods that were not identified. Now in the last experiment, we wanted to work a little bit on the DI side, evaluate how the quant is doing in our, uh, in our experiments. So we wanted some form of positive control. And in this case, we had access to four uh, different blocks, two of which represented uh, uh, mice organs that were embedded on FFPE blocks that came from wild type. And then the other two had a genetically engineered um, uh, overactivation of NCOA4. And uh, the way we designed this experiment is we pass it through our workflow and then at the peptide level, we do a cleanup. And then we would, uh, we would pass it to these samples through either the TMT workflow where you'd label each sample individually with a tandem mass tag. And then you would fractionate that sample into 24, uh, you pull that sample, then you fractionate it into 24 different samples that you would analyze with DDA. In this case, we used LCMS2. And we searched that in FractPipe. But also, we decided to analyze each sample individually with DIA. And uh, we've had access to three different instrumentation, the Explorers 480, where we use the wide window DIA, the Tim Stoff HD, where we use the ion mobility and DIA passive. And we've done the Orbitrap Astral, where we have access to speed, and we've done the narrow window DIA analysis. And to do a fair comparative assessment of the IDs here, we decided to use Diane, which is uh, compatible with the three different instrumentation that's also run on Terra. And it's really worth noting here is that the TMT process is much slower, given that you have a lot of sample prep involved, and that usually takes a whole week, while the LCMS acquisition with LCMS2 can be just as slow as eight samples per day. On the other side, um, with DIA, the sample prep would cost us pretty much two days, and then the LCMS acquisition would be dependent on the instrument, just as slow as 12 samples per day, and just as fast as 60 samples per day. So to go over the... Uh, IDs that we're seeing, as expected, TMT would give you the highest amount of protein IDs of 10,400 unique proteins that were identified. However, Astral is almost at 10,000, which is pretty phenomenal um, for running samples at 60 samples per day and really shortening that workflow to almost two days of sample prep. And then we see the Tim Stoff HD and the Explorers both ranging around the 8,000 range. Now, the unique peptide identifications, as expected, TMT would give you the best depth given the deep fractionation that we've done, but DI is still doing really good in terms of how it's comparing to TMT. And what we wanted to evaluate here is a positive control to look at the NCOA, uh, NCOA4 gene overexpression. So we had two different groups, an uh, overexpression and wild type. And when we compare the overexpression to the wild type, we're able to quantify the overexpression of this gene in all of our DIA methods. However, one observation has been that TMT has been underestimating these full changes that we're seeing uh, that's observed in both of these blocks. So we decided to do a further uh, evaluation into why this is the case. So one thing that we've done is we decided to look at a global view of all these protein full changes. And we compared all of these uh, full changes from the Orbitrap Explorers, DIA, the Tim Stoff HD, and the um, TMT on the Explorers as well, when we benchmarked that against the Astral, which is showing the scatter plot. And we really see very strong correlation among all observed protein fold changes between the Explorers 480 DIA and the Tim Stop HD DIA passive. But then we see that the correlation drops when it comes to TMT, 
One explanation for this is just a TMT compression problem, which comes from the co-isolation interference. And I was using LCMS2, so that's slightly expected. But overall, seeing the DIA is actually uh, matching nicely across three, three different instrumentation uh, looks really good for us in terms of our workflow. And we've decided to do one more level of reproducibility measure by looking at the protein CVs from all the groups that we've analyzed. And regardless of the method, the CVs are reproducible in all of the tissue. And um, one more thing to look into was how significant was this upregulation of NCOA4. And clearly, NCOA4 is among the most significant upregulated targets. And we do identify a few other proteins that are related to iron metabolism that are related to these tissue. And in conclusion, really, the Covaris ultrasonic gator is eliminating the need for xylene here, and it speeds up the protocol to a 96-well plate format. But also, we're able to produce data on a full plate of macrodissected material in almost five days. And whether you go with TMT or DIA, you're going to achieve good depth as long as you have a good sample preparation process. And you really, if you're interested in more details, I have a poster today um, from 10.30 to 2.30. Come visit and let's have a chat. And last but not least, I just want to acknowledge a lot of the people at the Broad that helped in developing this platform. Uh, Shanka, John, Simone, Mike, Mani, and Steve, but also the people from Kovars were really helpful in helping us set up the instrument and teaching us how to use the ultrasonicator. I want to give special thanks to Lillian for helping us demo the Orbitrap Astro with our samples, and the Van Andel Institute and the Washington University in St. Louis, Govindan, um, for helping us in getting the blocks and doing the macro dissection process on them. And we'll take it to questions from here.